Violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire, because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. There was reference to democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years, and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. We. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. In Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world, Britain came right in. There were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars, and India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer, went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India, while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. Uh, <laughs> while, and the British had the gall to call him Clive of India, as if he belonged to the country, when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. <laughs> By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. Between 15 and 29 million Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written, militant policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is uh, Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism, to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, Churchill's conduct in 43, simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said and on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire, because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. <laughs> well, let me quantify World War I for you. One sixth of all the British forces that fought on the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded. Another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies, and in the end, 
the total value of everything that was taken out of India. India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger was in today's money, eight billion pounds. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War, it was even worse, two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't belabor the point, but of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. Uh, they, <laughs> They were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental. Transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk. Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We were denied democracy, so we had to snatch it, seize it from you. With the greatest reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule, and that too with limited franchise. The British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. It's been pointed out, for example, the dehumanization of Africans in the Caribbean, the massive psychological damage that has been done, the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. Even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. The fact is very simply, sir, that we we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone for the wrongs that have been done. And I, I am quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't evaluate, put, a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out there. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle is what matters. The fact is that to speak blithely of sacrifices on both sides, uh, as a, a, an analogy was used here, a burglar comes into your house, ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. That, I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable argument. Um, the truth is that um, uh, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this house is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed, to whom it should be paid. The question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? As far as I'm concerned, the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. 
What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain and India. Thank you very much, Madam President. <laughs>